right, everyone. Um, I think it's still morning, so good morning. Uh, happy to see many faces through Zoom. Uh, we're going to get this started just uh, to, to make sure that we can get through a lot of the materials. Um, I want to say that we haven't been having the frequency of the meetings primarily because we haven't had as many changes or as rapid changes as we were having earlier on. And so we've been able to manage the best that we can, but it's important to keep everyone informed. And so we're, we're, we're happy to have the Zoom session. Also an opportunity, as I shared during the last um, Zoom sessions, we've been working with an Envision team and uh, a bunch of work groups that have been addressing more um, specific areas that we need for our fall return. Um, and so I had promised uh, the team <laughs> that I would take probably no more than 10 minutes in my remarks. I want to get through quite a few questions that came in. And a little bit of an introduction again of where we currently are. Um, from the very beginning, you know that we've been trying to uh, align ourselves so that we could have a fall return. But as I've shared from the very beginning, that fall return is not, not going to be uh, very typical. Um, and so when we started, Whole process. I had set goals where I wanted us to be closer to maybe 30% of face-to-face -face classes. That would be shifting quite a bit of what we're doing to the online environment or hybrid in some capacity. Um, from that point, we we work we, we uh, put together an envision team that began identifying major areas that needed to be addressed. We created work groups. Join the meeting. And we recruited into these work groups uh, with the intent of having representation from different areas, identifying, uh, you know, things that need to be addressed, um, as well as maybe other people that we need to uh, ask for information from. Um, and so the group has been doing a lot of great work, and some of you have been part of these conversations and periodic maybe happening in each unit. But we realized that this may not be getting to everyone. And so we wanted today to be an opportunity where we could share updates from each of the work groups, as well as provide you know, some insight in as to what it's starting to look like. When we put all of this together, what happened simultaneously is that UH put together other work groups at the system level that were addressing very similar topics. And so, they began and put together some guidance and asked to maybe some instructional modalities and some resources that are available uh, to help us make fall return. Um, while all of this is happening, of course, we were finalizing our spring semester, we were building out our summer, we tested out a couple of things. Uh, there are a couple of classes that are piloting uh, in summer session two for a off return to the campus. And we have gotten tons of questions on things that we have not come yet to some conclusion, but I did want to make, make you aware that there, there, are, there are conversations that are happening. For example, some of the work groups are assessing what the space capacities are um, while maintaining some level of distancing. Again, health and safety is very important to us. And so, as we are developing this guidance, UH is also putting together a, uh, a document that's going to guide our reopening efforts just to ensure that we remain as, as safe as possible as it relates to COVID. You've all probably seen that there have been spikes of the COVID uh, positives here in Hawaii and, and nationally. Uh, we, we realize some of this would have happened as we began reopening. And I'm not speaking about you, I'm speaking about the states as a whole. And so we're hopeful that we'll be able to manage and control the, the, the exposure of this COVID-19, but we still have the plans of returning. And so a return in the fall, well, the questions that have been coming up are, you know, are we following social distancing uh, recommendations? We are. Recommendations shifting. Well, some of you may have heard the DOE had been exploring a three foot social distancing. These are conversations that are happening. We're not hiding that they're happening. Uh, but, but the reality is that we're planning for the six foot social distancing. That's probably where we're going to end up. 
but I'm not suggesting that the three foot uh, has not been explored uh, by UH. Other questions include, will employees and students be required to use face coverings? And so the required component of that question is where, where we're a little bit concerned. And so we are waiting for some final guidance from UH and the governor's office on whether this is something that we can require or whether it's something that we can, you know, very, very heavy suggestion for. Um, but it's, it's something that has held back some of the progress that we would have wanted to. As an example, we know that we are going to have um, signs all over the campus as it relates to, you know, keeping that social distance, whether we're going to have a requirement for facial coverings. And all of this has been held on the language that we can use, whether it's a required versus a suggested use of facial coverings. And so these are things that are going to come up a lot sooner. I'm hopeful that by the end of this month, we'll have some more of that guidance. Um, there are other questions uh, revolving around when are we required to come back to work? Well, UH as a whole has not really closed per se to employees been very, um, we've, we've asked everyone to really explore opportunities from working from home so that we could best manage the campus facilities. And so if you're for using your spaces, just make sure you coordinate with your supervisor or unit head or division chair, just for awareness sake, but we haven't restricted the use. We would want to just be able to manage it best. And so I don't want to speak on behalf of Mark's area. I'm sure he'll be able to address a little bit more. But it's a matter of maintaining a, a healthy and safe environment here um, at Leeward. The last thing that, um, and I just want to make sure I hit my questions before I, I start going around with the, with the work groups, is um, whether there's been any conversations about ending the semester um, with aligning the semester with Thanksgiving. Um, and again, some of the concerns are back home or visit family during Thanksgiving, and do we want to maybe avoid a spike on the COVID positive? Um, those are conversations that are happening at, 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 at the system level, but I haven't seen that much traction in, in that direction, and so I don't know that it'll really, um, you know, stick for UH. But there are conversations that are happening. Um, it's also something want to decide very soon if it were to come to fruition, which I don't believe it will, uh, because it does take planning to decide if any of this is actually going to change. And so I don't believe it will. And so with that, I want to just set the tone to the next rounds of conversations that are going to happen so that we could allow some time at the end for questions. Um, but what we've done and what I've tried to share from the beginning is that we set an envisioning team that members from our governance groups um, and envisioning team uh, mainly because we are sort of setting this scaffold for all of the things that we need to do for a safe fall return and so um, from this group what we did is that we threw a whole bunch of um, ideas concerns things that need to be addressed um, and and we categorized them and then from these ca uh, categories the work groups derived we sent the message uh, some time ago with the membership of these work groups and more or less what they were looking at. And they've been doing this. And through these, we've been having some recommendations that have informed some of the instructional uh, decisions and changes that have been coming about. Um, but there's still a lot of work to do. And there are still some unknowns that are moving targets. Um, I, you know what, I totally forgot to mention this budget, you guys. I know that a lot of you are, are in on these calls to get a sense of what's happening statewide and what's happening with our budget. I'm not going to add that it is scary uh, because we haven't opened up tourism, but the state continues to hurt on the revenue side. Today, the ledge was reconvening to work on more details on money. Um, the, the, the university has not received its allocation, which is pretty scary, especially because the fiscal year flips, when is it, next week? Um, and we don't have a budget to work on, and so that's certainly scary. Um, we don't know what it'll look like. We're preparing ourselves 
to be under extremely tight budgets. We've been very frugal. Forward. We've tried to control the spending to the best of our abilities. Um, but we don't have any answers there. I didn't want you guys to think that we, we knew something that we don't know. Um, and, and so we, uh, as updates come about, I, I, will, I will chime in again. And so, like we've been saying all along, we've been thinking that this transition between June and July would be when a lot of these answers would come about. And so we'll be sure to schedule meetings as more of this um, evolves. And so with that, I do want to move into the, uh, the work group uh, um, report out. And so I'm going to go in the order of instruction, facility, technology, and campus services. And so I'm going to toss it over to, oh, I know that a lot of questions are going to come out today. I did want to say that a lot, a lot, if not all of the information that will be shared today has been shared with, with either division or unit heads, and so we do want your questions to funnel through that area, if at all. And so if anything evolves during today's meeting, if you can send your questions that way, just to keep your units involved and the concerns that may be bubble, bubbling up, um, we'll be able to answer some more global questions here, but there are very specific things that are ha being handled at the unit level, and we wanna make sure that, that, that that's recognized. And so with that, I wanna toss it over to instruction and so I don't know if anyone, maybe Leanne or Kathleen managing, whatever, I'm gonna mute myself, but I could toss it over to Michael. Kari? <laughs> Carlos, you have to give him access screen. Oh, Leanne and I can't. Okay, I'm going I gave, to I gave, actually I gave access. Oh, it? Okay, good. All right, I'm going to mute now. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, as Carlos mentioned, most of what I'm about to share it is uh, available to all the committee members, it's available to the admin, it's available to division chairs and unit heads. So, um, and don't hesitate to reach out. We're happy to share whatever information we have if, if you don't get it through one of those uh, more official channels. Um, our instructional working group was basically tasked with informing any adjustments to instructional de delivery for the fall 2020 semester and uh, potentially going forward as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the committee leadership, we just want to thank, I want to thank Michael Oishi um, for serving as um, co-chair of this group with me, as well as for the serving members, Catherine Fujioka and Mai, Rachel Inake, Jim West, Rhonda Mahira, Jim Goodman, Kelsey Aguilera, and Danny Wyatt. Um, special thanks to those folks who have given us really uh, invaluable information. Janelle Oshiro, Helmut Kay, Mikey Harada, Michelle Igarashi. And then obviously uh, uh, special thanks to the admin and all the work they've been doing as well as all the division chairs and uh, coordinators. So together we were trying to understand the situation of COVID-19 as it relates to the instructional delivery and kind of chart a path forward that was clear uh, both to the decision makers um, as well as the students. Um, I mean, above all that we were concerned with the health and safety of all of our faculty, staff and students and um, are still very committed or fully committed to providing the best opportunities for student learning and success. Um, as Carlos mentioned, it's kind of a, a temporary measure but a really important one um, admin has encouraged faculty to move instruction uh, to online environments, certainly whenever possible and, and when appropriate. Um, our group began with a target of about 70% of fall 2020 courses at, at Pearl City at least to be delivered online or via distance education. Um, you know, this general benchmark was informed by, um, you know, the best of the information that's going around nationally and CDC risk, risk levels and and various institutions of higher education opening up for fall 2020, um, incorporating an, uh, an understanding um, best practices for social distancing and, and sanitation. Um, the remaining courses which aren't uh, able to go online or fully online are encouraged to utilize hybrid strategies, um, especially Waianae Moku campus uh, due to their unique environment. Um, and also division chairs are sort of strategically considering how to use um, hybrid 
uh, courses to deliver face-to-face uh, -face lab studios and, and other courses that require practical components or have licensing requirements um, for field components. So there's definitely some, some uh, challenges that are associated with planning for fall 2020 with regards to scheduling. Um, and and our, our um, yeah, I guess our most, um, our best guidepost is that if we can move it online and instruction online when possible, um, that's best. So the immediate goal for the instructional work group was modeling, and this is what we've been modeling through the last um, May and June, is supporting the efforts for the finalization of the fall schedule, which should be coming up here within the next week or so. So um, as a whole, these scheduling of courses is generally the work of the program discipline coordinators in conjunction with division chairs, and then moving up to the deans and the admin level. Um, and we just are extremely thankful for the academic leaders that we have, the div chairs of discipline and program coordinators, who've had to interpret and analyze a lot of this information and then uh, are responsible for communicating it clearly uh, to their faculty and their divisions in order for faculty to make the best decisions that they can. So we respect that, you know, there may be um, uh, a few loopholes or places where we haven't communicated perfectly and we are absolutely um, uh, willing and committed to communicating all this information to everybody who needs it. Um, our main energy, uh, we focus on uh, producing and communicating a scope of recommended instructional modalities. Um, we presented these modalities to the div chairs and coordinators, and those modalities uh, were based on what campus resources we have available, uh, classroom capacities, and some of the enrollment constraints that were provided by the UH system or our own administration, as well as taking into account um, a bunch of instructional experts and college administrators who are managing similar situations across the country. Um, we ended up recommending five modalities for course delivery in fall 2020. I'll share um, sort of some brief, um, I'll share those briefly with you, um, but uh, know that they were kind of organized according to the CDC risk levels for institutes of higher education, with the lowest risk being faculty and students engaging in online learning. Uh, more risky environments were small in-class, um, in-person classes, activities and events where individuals were remaining six foot distance and are not generally sharing any objects. And then uh, the highest risk, which is a, a regular sized in-person class with standard activities and events. Um, and the, this is again, the highest risk. So with our instructional modalities, um, the low risk options include, as you would imagine, uh, distance education, and these are either synchronous or asynchronous. Synchronous being that uh, students are participating in regularly scheduled classes um, and times through a video conferencing software. And then um, they're required to complete other learning activities and assessments outside of that time. Um, another option, option C, um, in, in our language anyway, the distance education, the asynchronous, where students are participating in structured learning activities in an asynchronous fashion and then are required to complete assessments and testing uh, to demonstrate their learning. For many of us, we realize that these words and modalities are kind of common, but we also completely respect that there are many of us who have not uh, taught online or used these types of um, modalities. So again, those were the lowest risk options. Uh, uh, a little, a slightly more higher risk includes some elements of face-to-face, -face, and these are, um, sort of a split hybrid or a hybrid option. In the split hybrid um, with, a, with an asynchronous component, you just have your normal class size and you generally spit, uh, excuse me, split that class into um, two days a week. If it was a Tuesday and Thursday class, you'd have half the class meeting on Tuesday and the other class uh, meeting on Thursday. And then if it's an asynchronous, when those, class, when those groups are not meeting on Tuesday and Thursday, they would be doing asynchronous uh, learning activities, assessments, and testing outside of that environment. Um, another option D, the hybrid, is just with a synchronous component. It would be the same thing um, in that you would have two, uh, you'd have a normal course, Tuesday, Thursday, for example, that would be split into two groups 
One of those groups would be attending via video conferencing on the Tuesday. One of those groups would be attending via face-to-face -face on a Tuesday. And then you would sort of flip roles. Um, those ones take the most amount of planning. And um, as a result, they will be sort of that if you were to choose that option, that would be communicated in banner at the time of uh, registration. Um, option E is a hybrid sync uh, or in a hybrid async. And the uh, hybrid synchronous is just that you would have a, a regular synchronous uh, online course delivered at a specific date and time. And then uh, you could include a select few face-to-face -face meetings for those students and communicate and the instructor would be responsible for communicating uh, when those meetings are uh, and those meetings would be required to follow sort of social distancing guidelines. Um, the hybrid async would be the same exact scenario, just instead of having a synchronous online component with meeting dates and times, you have an asynchronous course meeting online, and then uh, you would select uh, a few face-to-face -face meetings um, throughout the semester or the beginning of the semester or at the end of the semester to manage those aspects of your course, which uh, require some of the SLOs to be demonstrated in face-to-face. Uh, -face. Um, the highest risk option would be what we're calling option A, uh, some of you may be familiar with, and that was just a traditional face-to-face -face course. Um, and, and as it stands, and as Carlos mentioned, that one is, it, normalcy is just really not something that's in the cards. Uh, it may be offered in very unique and very specific circumstances, um, but it's not, um, not likely. So um, those are the modalities that we came up with. There is additional documentation. Uh, Michael Luishi has shared in the chat if you guys need access to that. Your division chairs, unit heads, program coordinators, discipline coordinators should have access to all that information and should have a reasonable grasp of it. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to start there. That would be the best. Um, just some more recent information that everyone might not have been filled in on. Uh, at one point in time, we weren't sure, certain whether or not um, Banner was gonna be able to accommodate a cross listing of codes. Um, it's come to our attention recently that Banner will be able to accommodate cross-listing of codes. And so um, option D, which is the, the hybrid, is a much more viable option. And the uh, cross-listing will allow us to communicate with students up front when, uh, sorry, at the point of registration, when their courses uh, will be scheduled and what their responsibilities for participation will be. So that is good. Um, just a few more points. Um, over the course of this process, we've just been careful to empower the division chairs who are really responsible for working with faculty to do scheduling. Um, and then um, we've been focusing on faculty preferences, recognizing that they're uh, you know, most aware of their own situations with regards to uh, health and safety. And then we are uh, through dialogue between the division chairs and the administration trying to uh, make the best decisions uh, based on what is feasible given resource constraints or any other existing health recommendations or compliance measures. Um, we did our best as we were kind of coming up with these modalities, we did our best to make sure that they fit with current academic policies and procedures at the campus level at UHCC. And we did um, our best to make sure that union uh, perspectives and workload issues were worked through the process as well. Um, everything I've said here, and I just have just a couple more points, um, everything we've, all the decisions we've made or all the um, considerations we've made with regards to instruction for fall 2020 is all underneath a consideration that we may at some point in time, given any kind of outbreak, uh, need to transition back to an all online remote or distance delivered uh, modality similar to what we had to do in spring. We realize obviously this is not uh, the ideal, um, but it's a very real possibility. So getting ahead of that um, might be in faculty's best interest. And so um, the Distance Education Committee did put forth some baseline recommended actions for distance delivered instruction. If you are migrating to a distance delivered course, or if you are choosing a uh, hybrid modality in which you will have some online um, 
components to your class, it would be really useful if you checked out the baseline recommended actions for the distance delivered instruction, and that would help to inform you. I know that along those lines, um, administration and, and, and the working groups will be um, continuing to support any of the professional development that's going on on campus uh, for the folks who need the support in those areas. Um, and then we realize that some of these decisions are, may impact enrollment. Um, and admin and division chairs are aware of this and they are absolutely doing their best to, to manage and mitigate any enrollment challenges that are gonna result as a, um, as a result of these changes. And then finally, um, in the spirit of shared governance, you know, while we were making a lot of these larger um, systemic decisions, we did our best to make sure to include as many of you all as we could. Um, we had a lot of faculty input, staff input, division chairs um, worked alongside with their program coordinators, um, as well as input from academic services, our technology working group, the facilities working group, administrative services, um, and all the other shared governance groups. So we really appreciate your patience as we work to get all this information out, and we hope that it's helpful in making decisions going forward. So. Um, with that said, um, I will um, pass the torch. Thank you for that, Michael. Uh, very comprehensive. I, I do have uh, Kay that has a couple of recent uh, things to share. Sure. Michael, thank you. Great report. And thank you to the instructional group for coming up with that presentation that really um, made a concise um, description and made it understandable of each of those modalities. That served as a basis when we went to faculty to ask them to choose their preferences. It doesn't mean they would get their preference, but we, off, we wanted their insight into what, which modality best suits their classes. I am so happy to report that I think we have a 99.9% .9 return from all the faculty even though they're not on duty, we know they work year round. So we really appreciate them getting back to the division chairs. Thank you to the division chairs, as well as the working groups, program coordinators, the deans, everyone for working together to make this really, really big change. It's nothing like we're normally done. It causes a lot of lack of sleep on my point, but I think we're almost there. This is our week. We're gonna go and finalize our schedule. And then after that, we have Janelle to thank for converting a lot of this into banner as well as our, our division secretaries. So hot off the press, I just whispered these numbers to um, Carlos. Rather than going down each of the modalities, um, I have about 96% of the classes that I'm gonna tell you what category and how many classes and the percentage. And I think you'll be surprised because Carlos's goal was to make about 70% of our classes online, hybrid, and maybe keep only 30% because we're really concerned about distance, um, social distancing. So right now, our DE sync, which means they have the teachers have a scheduled time to meet with their students online, as well as DE asynchronous, that they don't have a time schedule, but they have online work. We have 50 57% of our classes, and those are modality B and C, and that counts for 724 of our sections. Our hybrid, which are categories D and E, we have 31% or 393 classes, and our face-to-face, -face, unbelievable. We've gotten down to 7% or 91 classes. I have 52 classes that I'm sure it's something I did wrong this weekend and in sorting and doing things. We have about 52 more classes. I think most of those were face-to-face. -face, and if so, our face-to-face -face would go up to maybe 10 or 11%. So that is just credit to everyone working together. So thank you so much. This week, section by section, I'll be working with the division chairs and secretaries as well as the deans to finalize and make sure everything is, is what they want. 
with the addition of new CRN, you know, that we can cross list that Michael mentioned, I know there will be changes. So when we make the final schedule, which is always going to have a little change, but I will send out the final numbers in each of the categories just to share with everybody so you're aware of that. Um, so by Friday, we'll have our schedules done with the divisions. Janelle will take over. And then we're hoping to have something on our website and notification to our students that they are aware when their classes are changing because we know that they don't understand everything that's going on. So we're going to do our best to message out to them in various ways. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, but I think we're, I, I'm, I'm getting a little more comfortable that we're going to have a by Friday. So thanks for everyone's um, hard work. And we'll be getting more information later. Thanks, Carlos. Thanks, Kay. All right, now punting it over to, uh, what did I say, facilities. Hello. Um, can I share my screen? Kathleen, did you set that up? Yes, you can share it. Oh, thank you, Leanne. All right. Short slideshow. Okay, so thank you for your patience. Really impressed with the number of people um, zooming in today. So I think we have more Zooms attending this session than Trump did in Tulsa. Yeah. Oh, we shouldn't be too political. I'm sorry. 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 We'll take a um, So at hand, the facilities working group. So thank you. Um, all um, eight of us who have uh, got together and contributed and that are still contributing to our um, facilities working group um, protocols that we're working on. So Betty, Danny, and William, and um, thank you so much. You guys bring um, some much needed perspectives into our process, and so very um, appreciative of that. Uh, the rest of the gang is from our administrative services uh, team. So Lori Grant, Joy, Nick, and William, thank you for your support. I should say also that Lori Lay is um, also uh, the facilitator of our employee services subgroup. And that group includes um, Patricia Domingo, I think Leanne, you're on that team. And um, um, we'll also be working with our student health center. So uh, it's been a great group to work with. Uh, so far, we've gotten uh, we're plowing through some of our protocol documents and I'll share them with you here. These are the things that we are currently working on and they're in various stages of uh, drafts. We certainly will share them out when we get to that point. Um, we have done so with our classroom seating uh, capacity guidelines. And so that was just so bring everybody up to speed. Um, we had a very small team go out and assess uh, classroom seating capacities uh, with the post or, or with the COVID uh, distancing guidelines, uh, social distancing guidelines in place. Our first assessment was with a six foot social distancing guideline. And then we were asked by uh, system officials to do the same assessment with a three foot social distancing guideline. I think the three foot was in response to the direction that the DOE was going in at that time. Um, there was no commitment by the university uh, officials, system officials, that we were headed that direction, but it was just an assessment to see what those numbers look like. So. Um, I do agree that I think we'll probably end up in the six foot uh, social distancing guideline area. And so we have taken those measurements and that uh, document is available for, um, for folks to see. Uh, we can share that out to the broader campus community uh, at the appropriate time. Um, the, the other documents that we are working on and we want to, our goal from uh, our facilities working group is to have 
the meat of these documents completed by the end of this month. So next week is what we're uh, focused on. So we have a return to campus guidelines. So we're identifying if you're in a classroom, what are the protocols for, um, for our students and our instructors in the classroom? If you are in an office environment, what are those protocols? Should you wear a mask, not a wear a mask? Those kinds of things. Um, we're also developing a standard operating procedures for campus cleaning and disinfecting. I should have put and disinfecting in that uh, title. And so that's in progress. I think we're, we're leaning on CDC guidelines, State Department of Health guidelines. Um, a lot of higher education institutions have, uh, are, are, um, have, have put out some really good documents that we're sharing with each other. So um, we have some pretty good uh, stuff to, um, we're not recreating the wheel, if you will. So there's a lot of good information out there that we can use and we're trying to incorporate. We are also updating our pandemic emergency operations plan, uh, not just a COVID pandemic, but pandemic in general. So that needed to be updated. And so that's, uh, we, we look to have that uh, in draft form for review starting next week. And then we're, we're also working on um, options from uh, furniture relocation plans, whether it's classroom and offices or outdoor furniture, looking at plans on where we might uh, stage different furniture that um, is in excess to a particular classroom, what are our options there, spreading out our outdoor furniture collections uh, so that we ensure the proper social distancing guidelines are in place, those kinds of things. Um, we're also put in, going to put out an information document related to our air conditioning and mechanical systems. So we're working with our uh, air conditioning uh, contractor, Johnson Controls, and system officials about having uh, some kind of docu reference document so that you all know what, is, what are the systems in your uh, building and in your room that uh, provide uh, our uh, climate control kinds of systems. Okay. And lastly, and um, we're about ready with this, and I apologize uh, for not getting this out sooner, but we're about ready to release our procurement resource list uh, related to COVID, and this resource list will have um, uh, places to go to procure, whether it's PPE or um, the safety barriers, sneeze guards, those kinds of things, uh, disinfectant supplies, and that kind of thing. Um, so um, we're about ready to have that, but I, I want to mention something with that procurement list. What we're also going to do is, um, centralize some of the procurement. So um, once we release the procurement resource uh, list, then, we'll gonna, then we'll be soliciting uh, departments and units for what they would like to have in their area. Um, so if uh, you want X number of face masks or face shields or that kind of thing, or if you want the, you think you need, uh, cleaning and disinfectant supplies and, or, or, or actually the sneeze and safety barriers, then um, we'll be collecting that information and then we'll buy in bulk uh, so that uh, we can uh, leverage our resources as best we can, but also that uh, we can hopefully streamline some of the uh, procurement uh, purchasing processes uh, at the same time. I do want to mention that I forgot to add Milton uh, from automotive to our list and that was my bad. So Milton, thank you. Um, you've been uh, really helpful and uh, a big contributor to our group. So um, that was an oversight on my part. So um, you're going to see uh, some information coming out from our working group here real soon. Um, like I mentioned, we had a, a June 30th goal to uh, wrap things up, and, or fr from a draft standpoint at least, and, uh, and we're almost there. Um, 
just in general, uh, just a couple things I'd like to further add. We're buying face masks and we're buying them in, in um, you could say, mass quantities. Uh, and so in preparation for a couple things, in preparation that uh, we get the guidance that face masks will be required. We're buying in, in quantities to ensure that if students or employees come to work or to uh, school, to class, that there is face masks available for them should they forget one or, or not bring it to campus. Um, we're also, so, so we're buying face masks in bulk. And, um, and some of these face masks actually are going to be logoed with the UH logo or the Leeward logo. We have those on order also. So it's also a way to uh, promote our campus when you're wearing your face mask off campus, right? And that kind of thing in, in the community. But uh, we're also going to be uh, procuring face shields. Uh, we have not received uh, clear guidance from... Uh, the UH system on face shields. There was some talk um, uh, a little while ago about face-to-face -face instructors having a face shield while they're um, uh, in the classroom. Um, so, but but I, I haven't heard anything further than that, other than it, at one time that was, uh, maybe somebody else in the working groups know, know more about that. But regardless, we're going to be buying face shields in bulk also, just in case and to prepare for um, that eventuality. The other thing I want to mention is a, there's another reason for buying product in bulk and doing it as I think as a campus is probably our best way to do this, is that um, from what we are hearing, and, and there's been some talk about the second wave of the COVID-19 uh, virus coming this fall, that there may be purchasing pressures in the fall also, not dissimilar to what was experienced earlier this spring, but so, so it, we, are, we are going to try to uh, stockpile our inventories to the level that we're not feeling that pinch should there be another a, a second wave of the COVID uh, outbreak. So um, we're just trying we're trying to do our due diligence in in that regard. Um, the last thing I'd like to mention uh, for our update is that our group, uh, administrative services specifically, will be putting together um, cleaning and disinfecting kits to be delivered to all classrooms and to all offices. So lots of campuses across the, the, the nation are, are doing this and they're including in the kit, the cleaning and disinfecting supplies, wipes if they are available, the sprays, the paper towels, all the cleaning and supply equipment, disinfecting equipment um, supplies that you need for your classroom or office environments. So. Uh, that will be uh, part of our July and leading up to uh, fall semester startup, um, one of our projects. Okay. I think that's it. I can address a couple questions that uh, I, 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 I got earlier. Um, one was involving food service in the Uluvehi and the learn, learning commons in the fall and whether social distance and hygiene guidelines will be in place. Just in general about our vendors and concessionaires. As you know, once, the, once we put a halt to the spring semester and moved everything online, our vendors closed down. Um, I've been pe periodically checking with our vendors and, um, and uh, during the, since the, the shutdown, and they indicated most recently that at the time that students return, then they would open um, their facilities for service. 
So we'll have, we'll, I think it's still, uh, like a lot of things, it's still a wait and see kind of thing. Um, a lot of it might depend on how many classes we're bringing uh, in a face-to-face -face environment because they will want to know that. And so our food and beverage suppliers are also concerned uh, about ensuring that um, they can stay in business and, and that kind of thing too, and have the uh, critical mass so that they're so that um, they're not losing money by opening up and, and that kind of thing. So I think it's still where it's a wait and see. If we do open our food service. Um, uh, options, then yes, we will be, uh, in fact, the um, cafeteria, Uluvehi, is already uh, situated with social distancing uh, guidelines in mind. So that will be part of our strategy for sure. Okay. Um, another question that came out was, how should we determine room capacity for our offices and departments? For now, you should use a six foot social distancing guideline. And that six foot social distancing guideline is from the middle of the seat to the middle of the next seat, okay? That's how, that's how we were instructed to, uh, take, uh, to make our assessments for classroom seating. And so we should be consistent in that approach. Okay, and then for in-person classes, last question I, that uh, we had gotten on this was for in-person classes in the fall, we have, have we considered putting a plexiglass in the middle of a six foot table for two people to sit? Um, yeah, so that's an option. Um, I think part of this was waiting to see what we're doing from, uh, you know, and Kay's update is very helpful as we, uh, assess how many face-to-face -face classes or hybrid classes that we might uh, be moving toward. So certainly that's an option. I have seen that kind of situation um, in conference room or seminar room kinds of setups where plexiglass, where social distancing isn't available, plexiglass is used to, um, to help as uh, the barrier. I think we're, we're, we're trying to be, we're, we're sort of leaning more on the conservative end. And so if we can social distance and still meet what we need to, the goals of our, our um, instructors and students, then by all means, I think we should do that. And so we'll assess the plexiglass option on six foot tables, I think more on a case by case basis. Okay. So um, I think that's all I have for my update and um, let me turn it over to uh, Leanne, right? Thank you, Mark. Okay, so the next one is the technology working group and our charge was to inventory the existing um, campus technology and equipment and then recommend technology solutions that will assist the instruction working group to meet their charge. So on our team, was Helmut Kay and William Alberton from Math and Science, Evelyn Wong from Business, Garrett from the Media Center, and uh, Byron from IT. So we've been meeting weekly since May, and we started out by adding to the list that Mark mentioned, um, the classroom capacity list. So we added the technology that's available in each of the rooms. So we had a more comprehensive view of what our campus has. And then uh, we were in a holding pattern for a little while as the instructional working group identified the instructional modalities. But once that was um, identified, then we really concentrated our efforts on the option E, the hybrid sync, which had the in-person component. So um, the team did recognize that in an ideal situation, we would uh, meet with each of the instructors, find out how they taught, and then based on that, identify the technology that would best complement their teaching. But because our time frame was short and because we found out that many of these technologies were on, uh, on back order already, we pushed ahead and we decided to go with our best guess at what 
most of the instructors will use. So we made a couple of assumptions. Um, the first being the 30% um, in-person, 70% remote. Um, the second is that instructors will be scheduled in and using the smart classroom technology. And then the third is that instructors have been using Zoom, so they're familiar with it and they're somewhat comfortable with using it as an online video conferencing platform. So with those assumptions, um, the team really looked at how uh, we could enhance what is already being done. And so uh, we came up with a standard package for each of the classrooms. And one of the goals that we had was that we wanted to future-proof or try to anticipate the continued use of this, this technology post-COVID um, environment so that we won't be throwing away this technology that we can continue using it. So what we decided on was a uh, package that consisted of a video camera on a tripod, a microphone, a document camera, also known as an Elmo to some people, and then a wired graphics tablet. And so when used in a smart classroom, it will allow instructors to be able to have two-way communication with pretty good audio and video with a remote audience, be able to draw or notate using the graphics tablet and the whiteboard that's already in Zoom, and then also to demonstrate physical objects using the document camera. So like a um, something like in a lab or something small like a uh, calculator could be put on the uh, document camera. And um, the team is recommending that we set that up in the classroom and that it's secured and left for the instructors so that they won't have to set it up daily. Um, in addition, we, we recommended purchasing a few remote kits that could be used in the field or, or in labs or in people's offices. So it gives us a little more flexibility with those environments. And then finally, uh, we recommended purchasing a few voice amplifiers, web cameras, and headsets. Um, the voice amplifiers would be helpful for people using masks, for people who are soft-spoken, um, or using those face shields in case um, they can't be heard. So we bought a, we're recommending buying a couple of those. So where are we? Um, we started the process to procure the technology. And I really wanted to thank Garrett, especially because he took on the uh, load of um, identifying the technology that we're going to be using and then putting it out for Superquote. So thank you for all your work on that. Um, and then we hope that the technology will come in in a timely manner so that it can be installed and tested before the fall semester. Um, and the EMC will provide training for instructors who will be teaching in those classrooms um, with the technology in those rooms. And then we also hope to um, train student help both in academic services as well as in the divisions to have a group of people who are gonna be trained and able to help with using this new technology. And that's, that's it for the technology group. Thank you, Leanne. Cammy. Okay, hi everybody. Um, so my group is the Campus Services Work Group. We are a 10 person committee, mostly from student services and academic services. So on my committee is Kalei Ruiz, who is the primary facilitator for our group, Lexer Chow, Corey Connor, Grant Helgeson, Jen Chung, Leanne Santos, Wade Oshiro, Brent Harata, and Heather Takamatsu. And like everybody else um, who have already talked about their work groups, this work group has been working fast and furiously, and, um, and um, as with everything COVID, things are changing and moving constantly, and so everyone has been working really hard to keep up with all of that and to still try to get something together. So I want to thank them also for all of their work on this. So the goal of our work group was really to focus on and provide guidance for the campus services um, and to provide guidance again on how they might reopen um, in fall 2020. Um, and so when I talk about campus services, what I really mean are the services that are um, uh, focused on um, supporting students and also services that are interfacing with the general public. So those are the, 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 surface, the services that we're talking about. Um, 
So our first charge again was to provide guidance for these services and how they might reopen. Our second charge is to provide guidance on things that maybe shouldn't reopen um, in the fall um, and to take it through that assessment. When we think about campus services, um, we are talking about really highly variable services that are, they're variable in purpose, format, foot traffic, who they service, um, the ability to control things um, and, and things of that nature. Um, they range from one-on-one -on -one services all the way to large gatherings of the public and free open spaces. Um, and because of that, our work group really decided early on that the best people um, to make decisions about these services are the services themselves. So we thought that the most helpful thing would be um, to produce a decision matrix to help people sort of go through the evaluation process of their services to decide whether or not it should reopen, whether it should be um, online, whether it should include some in person, you know, and things of that nature. Um, so that was the foundation of the work that we've been doing so far. Um, we are working actually on a website that will help um, take people through the decision matrix. So um, I'm gonna share my screen here. I can figure it out. Okay, so this is a preview of what um, the website is going to look like. This is in draft form, so um, we expect to finalize it um, by, and make it available by next week. But you can see that um, it takes you through, you know, sort of a decision matrix um, on, you know, what should be thought about and in what order for each service that the area provides. Um, we really based um, our decision matrix on three things. One is um, health and safety as a top priority. Second is equity of access. So once the health and safety things could be provided for, is there equitable access for people? And also is there quality um, of service? You know, in the way that, that the um, service is delivered, ensuring that, it, that um, it's still quality service. So this is what the decision matrix will look like. Um, and it's clickable, the boxes are clickable. So um, as you reach that point in your decision matrix, you're gonna be able to click on it and, and um, see more guidance around things that should be considered um, and, and suggestions of, of resources and things that can be accessed. Um, And so you can see if you decide that it has to be delivered because health and safety can be provided for, but in terms of um, equity of access and quality of service, um, we are going to do some in person. You can click on it. And again, there's a lot of um, information that will be here for you to um, think through how you will deliver um, that face-to-face -face service. Um, and it includes things like considering um, how you will manage foot traffic, how you will manage, um, um, how you will um, minimize sort of population density, you know, and things like that. So again, this um, website is not ready yet. Our group is committed to trying to finish um, it by the end of this week so that we can make it available next week. Um, there will be links on here for other things, such as um, there are a lot of, uh, resources for guidance around individual areas like libraries and things of that nature that we plan to also post here for people's reference. Um, and, you know, um, guidance will continue to come out from um, system and from um, the facilities work group and things like that. And as that comes out, our plan is to continue to incorporate that um, into the website. So the website will be changing um, in response to those things so that we can always stay current. Okay. I think um, we have not started on the piece about recommendations for um, services that maybe should not reopen in the fall. Our um, energies right now are focused around the dis finalizing the decision matrix. And that's it from us. Thank you, Cami. Um, we have a couple of other things from Case Area. Okay, first of all, we had over 90, about 90 faculty and lecturers who signed up for our professional development stipend. There's a pre-approval process. 
and they can get up to $200 per session um, if they meet the deliverables, and a total of three sessions were available for them to get um, the stipend. We went through approval process, so thank you to Aaron Thompson and Leanne um, in HR, Laura Lay and, and Nicole for, for um, creating the forms and getting everyone through that process. But if you did not, it, you know, some people didn't qualify and they knew up front, so they might not have signed up. So don't forget, you're still eligible. You can go into our regular EMC website and look for the workshops and you are welcome to attend them. You know, you just won't have the site then, but the workshop and the information you will have is valuable, especially for um, distance ed going back in the fall. So um, please sign up. And we'll also have some sessions available during convocation week. We don't know what convocation weeks are look like yet, but a week before school starts. Um, not too long ago, UH sent out an announcement announcing that Leeward had five tenure and promotions and 18 um, promotions. So congratulations to all those who applied. And, and it's a different process. It did not go through the Board of Regents. It actually is now approved by the presidents. So we'll be having that information sent out from our Leeward campus. So congratulations to those people. On the other side of the spectrum, congratulations to our retirees, those who have um, decided to retire. But if you're on the fence or you're not sure, you just want to learn more, at 1 o'clock in just about 20 minutes, Aaron Thompson through ICTL, along with Marina and Dottie, will be presenting a session, Eyes, eyes, wide, eyes wide Open, Exploring COVID-related retirement considerations is from one to two on Zoom today. Get the link from just by emailing Erin Thompson. But it's a great session. I got a preview on Friday. Makes me think. Anyway, back to you, Carlos. <laughs> well, some product placement there, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> um, so ju just to, to wrap up, I'll try to be uh, brief and, and still relevant to the conversation. One of the topics that I didn't touch on earlier um, is the CARES funding. We're still being very intentional in how we are using these dollars. Um, for what it's worth, CARES 1, which is supposed to go directly to student support, um, that, that, mon that money we've underspent, and so we're gonna put in quite a bit of effort to spend that money, and by spend, I mean, giving that money out to students because depending on how much money we spend in CARES 1 will determine the allocation that we're able to spend out of CARES 2, which is what we're using to, to address some of the shortcomings of the COVID preparedness. And so purchasing uh, the plexiglass, for instance, the CARES eligible um, expense. And so we'll continue to update on what we're doing there um, as it relates to CARES. There are some system-wide improvements that are happening that we're contributing to from CARES money, and some of it is just really uh, network infrastructure and stuff that I'm just not sufficiently familiar with, but just working out the kinks and ensuring that, you know, La Lima would be increased in volume and whatnot, that we're able to provide that support. Um, as was shared by, by Michael Cartery earlier, you know, we have been looking at our enrollment because it's important, especially in this time um, of, of, of tight budgets. And so I just wanted to share that for what it's worth, we are up 19% for the summer, uh, which is really nice. It's about 400 students. Um, there's a balancing act that we're playing here uh, the cares, the cares money. I mean, uh, the the summer students. Some of them may be a result of the next steps program, which is where our uh, class of 2020 and, and, and DOE um, are benefiting. Um, so they they have some foundation dollars uh, contributing to the to their to the classes, and so we're not getting tuition dollars there. We're getting what we would get through our early college, typically. And so, but it's still, it's a healthy increase in, in student numbers. For the fall, we're 15 and a half percent down um, in, in headcount. That is a pretty big hit. Uh, a good portion of it is contributed to early college. Uh, not all of it, but a big portion of it. 
And I would say that the other major indicator for the decline in enrollment in the fall is the unknown. Uh, like we feel a little bit concerned about not knowing exactly what's gonna happen in the fall, the students too will have the same feel. And that's where I wanna more or less wrap up today's conversation. It's really, if to you and me, the modalities of instruction or the changes that are happening are somewhat confusing, could imagine what our students may be feeling and some of them may have been opted to not register yet not knowing and so we're going to push out some communication campaigns with our students so that they are aware of the changes that are coming and like we have been trying to do with our own faculty and staff and trying to have these conversations maybe provide some professional development is to repackage the resources that we have and share them with our students um, it'll be important for us to help help out. Um, and so with that, again, we I, I want to recognize everyone that's been doing the work. I probably have had the easiest of it all, uh, which is to really work with the envisioning team in getting all of this happening. But the, you know the, the, the work groups have been really working really intentionally in addressing all of these gaps. Some of the things that don't come up in conversation is that we do meet weekly as an envisioning group and we identify gaps in what we are doing and try to see how we could mitigate those. And so there are gaps. Uh, it's not, it's nowhere near perfect, but we, I think that we're doing, in fact, a lot of the work that we've been doing, we've made recommendations almost at the same time that the system and other national peers have been making recommendations. And so I think that we're in line um, in, in, in the best way that we can. And, but, but again, I just wanna continue recognizing the folks that are doing the work and that, I don't know how many, I can't see from here in the screen, how many people are on right now? 165. There's 165 folks right now on this call. I was joking around earlier, maybe I could sell tickets to these meetings. <laughs> um, but but it's, it's been popular. I know that there's a lot unknown and that we're all anxious over what's happening and I'm very happy to provide these updates. But like I've shared with my team more directly, I think that the more frequent meetings that don't allow enough time in between for us to get any work done actually leads to more confusion. And so what my promise is, is that as decisions continue to come about, we'll continue uh, sharing those. Um, and so, did someone just say something? Um, we'll continue updating. Uh, the other thing that's really important is that not everyone can attend these meetings. Um, and so we will, in the near future, as things become a little bit more solid, we'll be sending out some of this information uh, electronically uh, so that those that may not be part of these Zoom meetings are still able to uh, gather the information. And so with that, I just want to thank you for your commitment. Um, remind us all, you know, our, our, our mission and our students and this you know, dire situation where we know that we need to think of other ways to support the state's economy. Uh, we have a major role to play here and, and no, no better way to do it than by working with our students directly. And so with that, unless Kathleen, are there any questions? Um, just uh, one person wanted to be sure that there were enough laptops available for students to run. Yeah, so, so we, we went through iterations of landing laptops and we didn't get, I don't, in my opinion, near uh, exhausting all of those computers. And so we still have those, we'll continue evaluating if we see volumes increasing, but I'm hopeful that our students are a little bit more tech savvy and, and they have their own, their own technology for this. Uh, but yes, we will have the loaners again um, for, for the fall students. Anything else? So like I said earlier in the meeting, if you have any questions, it would be really beneficial if you work within your groups, your, your coordinators or unit heads, because what you're experiencing may be something that's shared with others and it's just an easier way of getting the communication across. And through, the, through that capacity, some of these will come and inform our envisioning team. Uh, what is being planned if enrollment does not support enough credit hours for full-time faculty? That's a good question. Um, okay. we, we should, um, even if we had a little drop, what would have, happen, unfortunately, the full-time employees would still be employed. 
um, it, we, the first ones, we would have to let go of our lectures. And so go out there, recruit some new students. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that that's not a reality for us. It looks okay. And I'm hopeful again with the trends of post-recession enrollment that we will probably pick up on that enrollment. And so I think the bigger of the challenges is, you know, living with a, a very likely reduced, significantly reduced uh, appropriation. Um, but, but in terms of uh, loads, I, I hope that we could manage that with, with a lot, lot more ease. And our early college students haven't registered. I know a lot of students are hesitant about maybe going to the mainland or going to a four year because of their finances. So I think we'll, we'll see more people come in to, to register soon. And also, if people are on employment, some of that, those people will have an, an incentive to come back to school. Um, so usually, in, unfortunately, when economics are not good in our state, actually that's when our, our numbers go up. So I think that we will see an increase in our students. There, there's also been a bit of a lag in getting that enrollment uh, spike because of the COVID-related relief. And so once that relief dries out for, for the un, un, unemployed and underemployed, it's quite likely that we will see that increase and that's coming up pretty soon. Um, and so we'll continue monitoring this uh, for what it's worth. Leeward is leading the pack among the community colleges and enrollment and that's a good place to be in. Um, and we'll continue putting effort to, to remaining in that, in that position. And so, Maybe some of you heard Kathleen on the radio earlier today. <laughs> I want to make sure I acknowledge that. We are trying our best uh, to, do, to do anything that's enrollment, uh, you know, that, that, will, that will help with our enrollment. And so with that, I don't want to take too much more of our time. Um, if there are more questions, that link will remain alive. And so you could send them that way. But again, work with your units and within your units. And, um, and we'll continue to provide these periodic updates as more information comes about. So thank you guys, and thanks for staying on for this long. My goodness. Thanks, guys. Bye.